Okay. Um, please, can you can everyone see my screen and hear me clearly? I was actually talking, not knowing that I was on mute. So please, can can you all hear me clearly now and um, see my screen as well? Okay, okay, okay. I think that was um, that was my my mistake. I didn't admit myself. All right, so we're just going to be going straight into what we have for today. Course of time, I um, won't be doing any preliminary um introduction. So I will just skim through what we did yesterday. So yesterday I introduced us to several new concepts in machine learning, right? And especially the techniques used in reducing the dimensions of our data. All right. So I talked about um what the course of dimensionality is. Right, so we looked at um, the disadvantages of high dimensional data. So when we when we talk about dimensions, we are also referring to the features in our data. So I actually the same thing. So when we have a lot of features, um, we actually have um, a high dimensional data. So we looked at some other key concepts, right? We looked at um, strategies to mitigate um, high dimensional data sets like um, reducing the number of features so that um, our models don't overfit, right? So we looked at um, PCA. So um, can can someone just tell me the, the meaning of PCA, um, the full meaning of PCA in the live, in the live chat? Uh, we talked about that yesterday. We actually looked at it. So can someone just um, tell me or tell us the full meaning of PCA in the live chat? All right, yeah. So this is actually just a very basic question. So PCA is um, a technique used in reducing our dimension, also called principal component analysis, right? So principal component analysis. So I, I told you something yesterday that PCA reduces um, our features. Let's let's assume we have um, 50 features in our data set. I want to reduce it to let's say 10, we can use PCA for that. So the, the output or the um, results um, from our PCA is called what? I mentioned this in yesterday's class, right? After all the transformation that will be happening, there is a particular um, new, there are, there are new set of features that we're going to be getting. So what is, what, what is it called? What is the name of, that, um, of those features that we're going to be having? after the transformation. I need, I need, um, I need more, more answers in the group chat. So this is just going to be um, a very quick overview or revision on what we did yesterday. So we can just align and move forward from there. Yeah, exactly. So principal components. So we are all following. So if you, if you have gone through the video, you realize that we, we, we talked about this. So, Principal component is what we call the new features, the, the transformed features in our PCA, right? So we have features, right? So once we transform it or reduce it to, to the number of features we have, we don't call it the feature names again. Like for example, now we have age, we have um, height, we have weight, we have a lot of other features. And I um, want to reduce those features to like two, just two. Once we use PCA, apply PCA on it, we now have a resulting two principal components. So the first one will be called principal component one, second one will be called principal component two. So it is no longer age, it's no longer height, it's no longer weight. So it, there is a lot of the way the transformation was carried out on those features that we had initially, and then which result to principal component. So we also looked at, okay, I quickly told us what TSNE does. TSNE is um, also another technique for reducing our dimension, but we didn't talk about it. Um, and I told us that it is for visualization. So when you have a high dimensional data and you want to represent it in a visual, um, you most likely use TSNE for it. So it is impossible to visualize 4D data. Like you have four variables and you want to get the relationship between them using visuals. It's very, it, it's, it not, it's not even possible because we are limited to just three dimension as human beings. So you have to reduce the dimension and one way to do that is using TSNE, right? 
So we move forward to feature selection, right? We move forward to feature selection. So I think we stopped here yesterday where we introduced um, the filter method. So I talked about these three methods quickly. I told us um, um, what they do, right? So the filter method basically filter out features before training it to the model. So you get your features, you apply some, some operations on it, so we talked about some of the things you can do. You can use, um, um, you select the best number of features based on a particular criteria, right? So yesterday I, I um, showed us a particular um, scoring method we can use for selecting our features, which is chi-square, right? And I also showed us the other methods that we can use that are available. So I'm just going to, just going to um, assess us quickly here. So now, chi-square scoring method is used for what kind of um, of problem or machine learning task? So I showed us this thing yesterday, and I, I really I believe we've gone through that, and we also took you note. Know, so chi-square, the chi-square method for assessing or or getting or scoring our features in filter method. So let me just scroll down so you can see what exactly I am saying. So um, let me zoom in. So as you can see here, this is the code we use for selecting um, the best features in our data set. So we have two arguments here. We have um, score func, which is the function we are going to be using to score our features. And we have what k. k basically means the number of features we want to get, like the output, right? So this particular um, um, value here, it depends or you, you choose the value here based on the kind of task you are performing, right? So yesterday I showed us um, 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 some of the um, important um, 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 scoring method and I told us chi-square is used for a particular task. So you don't use chi-square in all the tasks you are going to be doing. So what task particularly are we going to be using chi-square? So only one person, um, only one person is answering this, right? I don't know if if we've not gone through the the um, video yesterday's video. So just let me just try to to bring it out and refresh our, our memory. All right. So so now if you quickly just go on jupyter notebook and you check the um, documentation of select k method right you're going to see um, All right, so um, because, because of time, we will not go back to that. Um, please go to the video we did, we, um, the yesterday's video and check it out. I don't want to waste more time on what we've done already. But basically, if you just go there, you see that we have score funk, which can take in um, any kind of scoring method. If you just scroll down, you see we have different scoring methods. Here. As you can see, as I showed us yesterday, we have F classif, right? Which is for what classification task? We have mutual info classif, which is um, for discrete targets, right? When you have um, a target, um, a target that has discrete uh, uh, um, um, variable type, right? We have chi square here, which is one we used. It is used for a combination of non-negative features and classification tasks, right? We have F regression, so. Uh, the reason I'm laying emphasis on this is because you you definitely be doing other machine learning tasks in the future, and the um, particular tasks will differ from what we've done today. So if you apply chi-square when trying to select feature on a different task that require you to use F regression or another scoring method, you're going to get a different. You're going to get um, um, something else. You understand? So. I need you to understand this and need you to understand how to approach this particular um, uh, um, 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 problem, right? So that is for select key best, 
So today we are going to be looking at other, we're going to be looking at other methods for selecting features. So we are still under feature selection, right, in SKLN. So I have several features. How am I going to know the ones that are important, the ones that is going to best predict my outcome, you understand? So we have what we call variance threshold, right? So we looked at select key bears. So we have variance threshold. So this is another um, um, approach to selecting features um, in our data set. So this differs from select key bears in the sense that you don't specify the number of features you want to select in variance threshold. Understand, variance thre threshold just select features based on a particular threshold that you specify. So I'm going to go over that again. Variance threshold, as you can see in the code here, select features based on the threshold specified. So I'm going to explain exactly what I mean, but let's just quickly go to Jupyter Notebook and illustrate what we mean by that. So I'll create a new cell here. I think we have to import variance threshold. Okay, we've imported it here already. Let me be sure we are, let me see the data we are working with here. Okay, let me let's convert it to pandas data frame. So you can see here that we have like a lot of features, I think about 64 features or so. So now um we're going to be using this particular data set to demonstrate how we can select um and features based on the variance. So remember I told us something while explaining PCA yesterday that variance is a very important, um, um, is, is very, very important thing to note in ML machine learning. So a variable with high variance is, is equivalent to a variable with um, um, better information or high information, you understand? So the lower the variance of a variable, the more irrelevant that variable is. So you're actually looking to get variables with higher variance. So I, I just hope that makes sense. So what this variance threshold does is that based on the threshold you specify, it is going to select those features that has or that is higher than that level of threshold and just discard the rest. So if you don't specify any threshold, it's going to basically just discard only those variables with zero variance. And variables like that can be maybe variable where you have um, just one particular value. Only like, let's say you have one variable and everything in that variable is one, 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 you understand? So the variance is going to be zero, basically. So if you don't specify a particular variance, it's going to give you, or it's going to remove those variables with zero variance. But when you specify, the variance threshold or the threshold, then is now going to be removing the, the variables that are great or that have variance less than that threshold. So let's just illustrate it here. So the first thing to do after you've imported your variance is to now instantiate your object. So you come here and um, you can just say var variance selector, right? And you say variance threshold. Right, and then you come and say threshold. So this threshold is a very important parameter that you need to always um you need to always indicate here. So let's just check out the the documentation. I love doing this, so you also build the habit of doing it whenever you're working. So you might not use Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is 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 actually very good, but some of us might might be using VS Code for for our, our project moving forward, right? So I just need to understand how to, um, to check out the documentation. So VS Code has a very intuitive way of showing you or describing each object in Python, right? So but for VM Jupyter Notebook, you just do your shift and tap and you see it. So very, very easy. You can just quickly um, read out what is there. So you can see here, this variance threshold removes all low variance features, you understand? It removes, so it basically doesn't have um, a specified number of features that you are going to be selecting. 
right? So it will do the selecting for you. So let's just continue. Um, let's continue within the documentation here, right? So you see now threshold here. The threshold. Hello. Can you can 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 you all see my screen, or is it just one person? You just about to do. Someone said they can't see my screen. All right, please. Um, about to refresh your network, please. Fresh your network. I, I think. All right. So let's just move. Let's just move on. So as you can see, here, the threshold um is usually a numerical um number. So float. So the features with the features um with training set variance lower than the threshold will be removed. You understand? So the threshold you indicate there will determine um how the um features will be selected so the default here is actually to keep all features with non-zero variance right so any feature that has zero variance will be removed by default so but if you want to increase the threshold level if you want to increase the threshold level you would have to now specify it in the threshold argument so if you come here and say 0.2 Right, so zero point two mean you should. So zero point two basically would increase the threshold level for the variance. So variance with um or variables with a threshold that is um less than zero point two will be removed, right? So the ones that are greater than zero point two will be retained. So if you put zero point two, more features will be removed. If you increase it to 0 0.3, more features will be removed. So if you increase it, so depending on the number you put here, it's going to determine the amount of features that will be removed from your data set, right? So this is just basically, let's just demonstrate with the data set here. So let's say, for instance, we are going to use 0, 0, .0 right? We'll run that, and then we'll come here and say var selector dot fit. Transform. So that's just one thing I like about SKLearn. SKLearn has a very consistent pattern across all the objects. So we're going to come here and just put our, I think our data set as um, X, right? So let me see if we've already um, um, done our this thing. Here. So yeah, X exactly. So we're going to put X here. So put X, right? So then you're going to see, it's going to give you an output. So let, let's just assign this to a new variable. Let's say X new. Then you're going to have X new dot shape. X new dot shape. So as you can see, we have five, six, nine um, number of um, observations and 30 features. So if we check the original um, shape here, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, still the same text. The reason why I didn't reduce the, um, the features because all variants or all variables here have a variance greater than zero, you understand? So let's change the threshold here. Let's change it to 0 0.2, right? And we'll come here and run it. You can see that it has reduced the number of features already. So it's selected. Um, um, it, it looked at all the features and those features with variance greater than 0 0.2 were now selected. So this is another way of selecting our feature. So all these techniques I'm going to be showing you are actually different feature selection techniques. So it just depends on you to know the one that you'll be using in your work, right? So we've looked at select K best. So select K best would require you to input the number of features that you want to actually select and you would indicate the scoring method chi-square, um, F-classic, and the rest, F-progression, and the, right? So basically, that is just how you use variance threshold for selecting your feature. So let's just move on because of them, right? So the um, other one we have here is what we call wrapper methods. So wrapper method is quite different from
Hello. So um, the wrapper method is actually quite different from the filter method. So the wrapper method basically wraps the um, the particular the particular method with a model. So it trains the model with the features that you are going to be that you are going to be selecting the number of features you'll be selecting. So I will explain that so you see exactly how it works. So in the wrapper method. We actually have quite some numbers mm -hmm. of methods here, but the one that is most important is recursive feature elimination, right? Recursive feature elimination. So basically what this recursive feature elimination um, method does is that it recursively removes features and builds model to identify the best subset. So I don't know if we understand what recursion means. Recursion is kind of a repeated process it does something and it does it again to that same thing and it does it's like a loop basically we understand what the loop is so recurse, recursive and um, feature elimination how it works is that it gets all the features that you have let's say in this um, um particular data set that we're working with here we have let's say 30 features so it's first of all trains the um, the model with all those features right it trains with all those features it gets an output. So there's what we call coefficient, depending on the algorithm you are using. So it checks for the feature that has the lowest impact on our outcome, on, on the model, basically. So the feature with the lowest um, 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 impact will be removed. Understand? So it will remove that one and now train it again on 29 features. So you train it on 29 features, check the feature, check for the feature that is the lowest, that has the lowest impact, remove it, we now have 28 feature, it will now train that 28 feature. So it recursively trains or recursively trains our feature on our model. As it's training recursively, it is removing the lowest on each iteration. So that is basically what happens in this recursive feature elimination. So it does that. It, it combines the, the process with training the model. So it is during training that it knows the feature that is least important. That's how it selects the feature. So, but there's something we indicate here, N features to select. So this is an argument that we select, we put aside the model argument, which I'm going to talk about. So this N features to select will indicate or specify how many number of features we are actually going to select. So when it is recursively selecting, or when it is recursively eliminating, once it gets to 10 number of features, it's going to stop. You understand? It is going to stop. So let's just show our, our implement that quickly in our um, in, in SKLM. So first of all, first thing you have to do is to import it, obviously. So we'll come here and um, you say from sklearn dot feature selection import RFE. So it's usually in this form, just like SVA or PCA. So import RFE that is recursive elimination, future elimination. So the same thing that you do. Um, using other classes, same thing you do here. But first, uh, you have to specify the model you are using. You have to instantiate the model. So, for instance, in this particular case, we are using, um, I think, linear regression, right? Oh, sorry, logistic regression. So, we are going to just specify logistic regression. Come here and say model equals to logistic regression, right? We'll just leave this here. Okay, we have to import it first. So I'll come and say from sklearn dot model dot linear model imports um logistic regression. So you run that um sklearn sklearn. So import that and then you come here and import. So once you do this, then you can now exactly have, yeah, I just saw that, thank you very much. So once you do this, you start to your model, then you can now come and then, then um, use the recursive feature elimination. So you just have to create an object and you come and say 
recursive or just a um, RFP in small data and say RFP. So it takes in two arguments, right? It takes in two arguments. The first argument is your model. So in this case, you are using logistic regression. We want to train our data using logistic regression. So come and say model, specify the model. And then the second um, function or the argument here will be N. Let's check here to confirm. That is N features to select. You understand? N features to select. So in this case, we are going to say, um, let's say 15, right? So the next thing to do is now to So we're not going to um we're not going to train um fit it and fit transform it on our data. So we'll come and say RFE dot fit transform right we we'll call your X and you we'll call this you should say S use S train, but let us use X, right? We've not split our data yet. So you say X and you say Y. All right, but let me let me split this data so we can be using S train and all right. Let me copy this from the one we already split. Maybe every time we split our data. Yeah. All right, so let me quickly split a little. I'll say, come here and say, S string, X test, Y train, Y test. I'll say, train test split. Let me say, X, Y. And then come and say, um, test size equals 0 0.2. Random state equals to 20. So we will import print test split from here. So from S, SKLN dot model selection import print test split. Right, so I'll come here and just run it. So pull your S train here and pull your Y train here. So basically, if you, so this is just a warning that your iteration, your model has not converged yet. So you need to increase the iteration. You can come and just put N. Okay, I'm not going to do anything. I want us to to tell me what to do at this point. I think we've, we've met this kind of warning before. So basically what all this warning is, is that my model has not gotten the best, um, um, uh, it has not finished training yet because we reached a limit in the number of iteration. So to remove this error now, what should I do in this particular code? We've looked at this before, so I believe um, um we, we we've all seen seen it before now so what are we going to do in this case or what are we going to add here that is going to um remove this particular warning so Okay, so where are we going to add max eta? Right, where exactly are we going to add the max eta? Where are we adding the max eta? So at this point, I, I, I expect us to just be asking these questions like just very, very easy. Like it shouldn't be much of a headache. So in this part, Clock now exactly. Thank you very much. Um, good. So we'll just come to the logistic regression and add the max eta, right? And just increase it to let's say 1000, right? We train this, right? It's still giving us limits, so we're going to increase it a little bit, but let's say 2000, 
right? So it's the same, um, the limits, it does not, um, I don't want to waste so much time, but let's see. So it's taking time because the number of iteration is very has to do that. So it has to do that and take a long way. So you can see that the, the warning has disappeared. Like we don't have the warning again. The um the warning for max iteration, 10,000. Ah, do you want us to sleep here? <laughs> no, this is just a demonstration. Maybe when you are doing your zero, you use 100,000 iteration. <laughs> okay, that, um, um, that's just an enlightenment. So basically when you see that kind of warning, you try to tweak in this parameter here, which is max iteration. So by default, the in logic regression, the max data is what, 100. So it's 100. So sometimes it might not come. So sometimes your model might not converge um, um, with that 100 iteration. So you have to increase the iteration to like, play depending on what works, right? So once you do that, you now train it, fit transform. So let's come here and print print the new trans newly transformed data. So if you say X new, you see that you can just say dot shape. You can see that it has reduced the number of pictures to 15, depending on what we specified in this place. So are you are you understanding the pattern here? All these things we are doing, they're just different ways to select our features. Right, so some of them might work better or might be able to select better features than the other technique, you understand? So you just have to try them all. So a lot of things to try basically. So um, these are just techniques that I'm going to be, are going to be using, right? So this is um, the recursive function elimination, right? So I've explained what it does. I recursively removes a, a particular feature that has the lowest. If you first train the model with all features, it, the output of the uh, model will now tell it which feature is has the least impact. So that feature will now be removed and it will now remain 29 features based on this data set. It will now retrain the data, the, the data um, 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 on the particular algorithm, right? Get the least feature, remove it. That's what we call recursive, recursive feature elimination. It is removing it recursively, you understand? So we do that and we get this particular um, shape here. Yeah. So let's just move on to the next one. So now we have um, the third method of um, picture selection, right? So as you can see, you've looked at filter method, which which basically use statistical measures to measure the score of each feature as relates to the output and select the number of features that is best. And then use wrapper method, right? And then the embedded method now. So let's basically just look at the embedded method. So embedded method is, is different, right? Embedded method is embedded in a particular model. Understand? So this one is not something you do separately. It happens as you are um, training that model. So for instance, now um, we have what we call, okay, an example in this case is lasso, right? So lasso now is, although I, I'm actually supposed to treat this in regularization techniques, right, but I'm just going to give you um, an overview of that. So lasso regression is a type of regression that includes what we call regularization. So we have two kinds of regularization. We have the L1 regularization and we have the L2 regularization. So what do I, what do I say regularization is in the pre previous class? What do I say regularization is so that we don't just get gone? So I'm sure that we understand what I'm saying. I mentioned in the previous class overfitting, when we were discussing overfitting and everything, and I told us different ways in which we are using overfitting. And I mentioned um, some particular um, 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 solutions to that. So what is regularization? I've given you a hint already, so I want us to, to still say it and answer the question. Are we following? Okay. 
I don't I don't like the way the class is dealt today. I can see that we are tired of what. Okay. All right, let me just move forward. So basically this embedded method here, as you can see in the brackets here, it is model dependent, right? And an example is um, lasso re um, um, regression or lasso regularization. So this lasso regularization is, is actually a model. So lasso is a model. It is a linear regression model that includes regularization in it. You understand? So let me just let me just show you here. So lasso regression is equal to linear regression plus regularization. Understand? So this is exactly what we mean by lasso regression. So it's also called L1, L1 regularization. Let me change it to regularization. It's a very, very important um, 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 regularization technique, which you should know. We have L1 and L2. We're going to talk about L2 um, um, in the next um, 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 topic. Right, so basically what lasso is. So when you use lasso regression to train your model, you're basically using linear regression, but you're adding regularization to that particular model. So let's just go straight to how it works. And this particular um, 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 lasso regularization, what this L1 regularization does is that it removes features that are not important, right? As it is training the model, it is removing features that are not important in that particular model and using the remaining features to train the model. That is what it does. So it is considered as a feature selection um, method, but this one is, it is happening as you are training the model, right? So there's, there are ways to implement the L1 regularization in other models like logistic regression and um, the rest, right? But just understand this embedded technique. So we've looked at the three techniques for feature selection. We've looked at, um, um, Let's go back here. We've looked at filter method, right? We've looked at wrapper method, and we've looked at embed methods, right? So we've, we've, we've looked at how we can use different techniques and that is different methods to regularize or to, I'm sorry, to select important features from our data. So the one that you have more control over is the filter methods here. Yeah. So we have more control over filter methods, but embedded method, you literally don't know which feature has been selected because it is happening as the model is training, um, um, on, is being trained on the data, right? So these are just the three different ways that we can um, um, select features. So it just depends on you to select the one that you would use or that you feel would work best on your particular data set. So let's move on to what we have, um, the next thing for today. So, so as you can see, let's just um, read the conclusion here. So feature selection is a crucial step in building effect, if efficient and effective machine learning models. Right? So SKLN offers various tools to perform feature selection, including, as we said, filter method, um, wrapper method, wrapper method and embedded method. So by selecting the most relevant features, you can improve model performance and reduce computational costs. These are the advantages of using feature selection. Right. So now let's look at um, pipelines in SKLN. We are going to look at how we can build pipelines. I right. so this is a new concept to us, and you might be wondering what exactly is pipeline. Wait, is the network disturbing? Can can you all see my screen and hear me clearly? Can everyone see my screen and hear me clearly? Hello? Sorry. 
Hello, can everyone see my screen and hear me clearly? All right, all right. So, um, let this not I don't understand it. All right, so we'll be looking at um, building pipelines in um, SKLearn. So in machine learning, a pipeline is a sequence of data pre-processing steps applied to our data, right? So a pipeline basically is like, you know, if you think of a pipe, when you think of a pipe, you think of um, a tube that has an opening on one side and has an opening at the other side. So something enters the pipe from the from the mouth and comes out from the end. Understand? So that is the same idea of pipeline escalation. So a pipeline is basically a a, a, a a process or a sequence of process where we put in our data at the beginning and at the output of the pipeline we have a pre-processed data. We have a fully processed data. So it makes everything you are doing easy. Right, instead of doing all these things um, in a very disorganized way, pipeline will actually make your work very streamlined and more organized. So, see, this is not a new pipeline; is not a new technique, right? In, in it, it does not improve anything. It does not improve your machine anymore. It just makes it organized. It simplifies the workflow for us in SKLM. As you can see here, SKLM pipelines help streamline the process of data processing ensuring that all steps are executed in the correct order, right? It also simplifies the workflow for model training and evaluation. So we're going to demonstrate that we can do that in SKLN. But let's just move on to um, um, talk about some other things. Right, so the key concepts of pipeline, um, we have, okay, why do we use pipeline now, right? Why can't we just use the normal um, methods in, that we've been doing or using before now, right? So um, one of the, um, um, reason for using pipeline that it streamlines the workflow in SKLearn, right? So it basically optimizes the sequence of data pre-processing and model training. That is actually the most important um, um, reason why we use pipeline. It automates the sequence of data pre-processing and model training. It ensures consistency, right? So it basically applies the same transformation to training and test data. We're going to demonstrate that we're going to see um, what it looks like. It also enhance reproducibility and simplify our code. So these are the um, um, reasons why we can choose to use pipelines in SKLearn. And these are very, very good reasons. So the components of um, pipelines, we have the transformers. So the transformers are basically the steps that process the data and then estimators. So these are the two components of, of a pipeline. So we first um, um, indicate the steps, the preprocessing step, and then we now fit it using an, a particular estimator. So now how do we create pipeline? So we are going to quickly, quickly um, go. I'm going to cover this. So, okay, so is asking, is pipeline not more of um, a data engineering work? Um, yeah, yeah, it's something similar, but this is different. This is for model building. It is a different thing entirely. So pipeline is a general concept in the tech world, right? So pipeline is just a process from that a, a particular operation that streams like streamlines a process from beginning to the end. Understand streams streamlines whatever process it is you want to do. Let, let's say in software engineering, you want to do five things. So instead of you to be doing it individually, you can just create a pipeline that you just that will automate everything for you at once and you just do it and get the output. So you can use it in software engineering, you can use it in data engineering, you can also use it the same concept in data science, right? So I'm going to demonstrate that we can use pipeline now. So you have to import pipeline. So basically you just come and say from pipeline, oh sorry, from sklearn dot pipe line import pipe line so i said a, a lot of modules <laughs> you've never started yet <laughs> actually you've started sure 
but there are actually a lot of models in um, SKLM. Right? So um, we import that and we are going to just start our pre-processing technique here. So in pipeline, in creating our pipeline, the first thing to do is to understand your data, right? Understand your data sets. So what exactly do I want to, uh, um, the, what, uh, what pre-processing technique do I want to apply to this particular data set? So I'm going to intentionally use a data set we've been using before to show you something. Understand? So I'm going to use the retail transaction data sets that we've been using. So we just say data goes to PD. I will import it. Read CSV. So retail transaction CSV. So I've imported that. So you can just Come and see data dot head. So you see this particular data set now. I am using this intentionally because it has different categories. You understand? It has numerical category, um, numerical variables, and it has categorical variables. So you understand that we can use pipeline to work on all these things at once. So first of all, I'll remove um, transaction date and customer ID, right? Because we don't need it for anything. So I just come here and say data dot drop or say columns equal to transaction bits and um first of all ID and I will say axis equal to one. And say in place equal to true. All right, so just run that in place equal to true. So basically, this is my data data now, right? I have product ID, quantity, price, payment, and everything. So now, for instance, what what I can do to this is that I'll first okay, let me separate the data into X and Y. All right, X is what. Um, data dot um, drop. I want to drop price. Price uh, because it's price we want to predict here. I will just say equals to one. Y is equals to price itself. So I'll say data dot 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 price. So we won't really use Y for anything, but just let's just do that. So now it is our X that we want to pre-process, right? We want to pre-process these particular features. So we want to convert these categorical variables, product ID, payment method, product category, to um we want to one hot encode them, right? And we also want to scale this feature quantity and discount applied, right? So we want to use pipeline to do all these things at the same time. How can we do that? So the first thing to do here is just to create an object of the pipeline and we'll come and say pipe equals to what? So pipe equal to um, pipeline, right? But there's something we would actually have to do first. We have to like um, select the categorical features and numerical features, numerical features separately because we can actually apply the same transformation because we want to do scalar um, and want to scale the numerical, want to want not encode in um, um, categorical, right? So we have to specify or select this different data type. So we we'll come here and say data dot select D types. The types and I will just say um, include np dot number. If you don't know this by now, I don't know. Just go and so you convert it to list. I can just easily convert it to list or say columns dot to list. 
Basic curling. I think this should not be there. So I'll do the same thing for numerical variable. Okay, no, no, it should be exclude. We are selecting the categorical variable, so we should exclude. So if if we run this, okay, we have to import numpy first. So we can say import numpy as np. Right. So we'll come here and do this. So if I say cut numerical, you see that these are the um these are the categories that were selected right for categorical. And these are the variables that were selected for categorical um data. You can see them here. So we'll do the same thing for numerical variable. Come here and say let's copy everything here. So we'll say numerical. See, the reason why I'm using this is because you might sometimes might know your you might have a lot of features, right? That you cannot start manually doing like this coming here and saying cut you can cut numeric let me just say cut numerica and you come and say uh product id for my no this is a, a less efficient this is a more efficient way of doing because you can have like 30 features so this thing will just automatically select all the variables that are categorical so for numerica we're going to include numbers so np.number is going to include all the numbers here so if i come here and say numerical num so you can see that it has um included all the um numerical i don't know why it's including price here but anyways let's just include price all right so we're not training any model yet so that's the first thing we're going to do we're going to um select the numerical features and the um um categorical features right so now we're going to create a pipeline for each of these features. So this should be feature, not numerical features. Features, come here and say features. So we'll create a pipeline for each of these features. So to create the pipeline, you can just create an object, the same way you do for other um, numpy class, num equals to the pipeline you imported. So there's something you indicate first which is steps so steps is basically the different steps you'll be taking in the pre-processing of your data you understand so for numerical picture now i want to first um fill in missing value and i want to go on to scale using standard scalar right so the first step here would be what we're going to have here is going to be a list a list of Okay, data. Okay, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, so it's in, the steps now we include the different steps you want to take in pre processing. So, the first step can be input, I'm simply using simple imputer. So, I'm going to do I'm just going to, I can name, put any name here. I'll say imputer and then put comma and then say simple imputer. Right, and simply what um what um, par, um parameter does simple imputer usually have? Can we remember what parameter does simple imputer usually have? Exactly, strategy. Thank you very much. Like. But we can still remember our previous lessons. Strategy. So the strategy here, I'm going to use mean, right? I'm going to use mean. So this is the first step in our pipeline for numerical features. So we're going to close the brackets here and put comma, and then come and create another. Um, this is a tuple, right? So say the next thing to do after you are filling the missing value is to scale the value. So I can come and say scalar and then comma and say standard scalar, right? 
So this is what you're going to have. So this is basically the preprocessing step for your numerical variables. So you have that as num pipe. So you come and do for categorical variable. You say cat pipe and say pipe line, right? Open the bracket, say steps equal to right. So the first thing to do, yeah, the first, the first thing you, you might want to do is to also use simple imputer to fill the missing value. So I can come and say imputer and say simple imputer and I'll say strategy equals to maybe I want to use the most frequent, most frequent and I'll close the bracket then comma. Next step will be one hot encoder. So I say one hot, one hot, any name you want to give it, right? So you come and say one hot encoder. So basically this is how you usually have your pipeline, right? So in the case where all your features are numerical features, so you can just create one pipeline for it. But in this case, our, our features, there is a mix of different types of variables. So that's why I'm intentionally using this so you understand how we can approach it when you have a mixed um, feature types or feature data types. So once you've created these two pipelines, you have to, you now need to join them together. So there's what we call um, column transformer. You understand? There's what we call column transformer. So column transformer can be used to combine or perform different operations on different columns. So the, um, the 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 class for this is called column transformer. So we'll just come and create an object, column transform, or you can say combined, combined, and come and say um column, you create an object of column transformer. So I'm introducing some new classes or some new um um, um operations in scikit-learn. So just just note those, just note them. So say column transformer. So what we have with column transformer, you have um the two different um um pipes that you've created, right? And you also have the features. So in this case, I'm going to have um first one should be um numerical so you can just put num here and then put num pipe num pipe right and then the, you will have three arguments basically right it's going to have three arguments okay this should be supposed to have um a square bracket first so you could have a square bracket basically so you now put this and the next thing will be your numerical features that you've created already so this is actually a lengthy stock. So please just have patience, right? This is actually a lengthy. So next thing will be your categorical features. And then you have um, cat pipe. You have cat features, right? So basically this is how you combine these two pipe that you've created already. If it was just if all your features were the same thing, it would have been easier. You just create one pipeline and you will not need to use this com column transformer here, right? So after you've done this, um, the next thing to do is basically um, just to use your, or train the pipeline or what you, or train your data using that pipeline you've created, you understand? So you now have to, um, any model, let's say in this case, want to use, um, let's say, want to use linear regression because the price is, price is um, a continuous variable. So I'll come and say model equal to linear regression, right? So now you now create the last pipeline. The last, pip the last pipeline will now actually combine the steps that is going to actually, uh, um, um, the step that your 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 data will go through. So you now come and say um, final pipe equals to pipeline, and then you're going to have. So basically, you've already um, 
created the processing pipeline, right? So this is the processing pipeline. We combined it to this, right? So we now come here and put pre okay, you would have steps as you had before, right? So you have steps, have a um, bracket list, and then you're going to have um the first um, um, um step that's going to happen here is the preprocessing step. So the preprocessing step in this case is going to be this we've created here, this combined pipeline, right? So it's going to perform these operations, right? So you come and put combined, com, combined, right? Next step after it has followed the preprocessing, what is going to happen is now it's now going to train the transform data on your linear model. So basically what you're just going to do here is just press a regression and then you say model. So now you've created your pipe, your final pipeline. So the next thing to do now is basically just to now train your data on using this pipeline. So I will just come and say final pipe, right, dot fit. So instead of using linear regression dot uh, model dot fit, you use final pipe dot fit. So it's, before it trains it, it's going to go through all the steps that you've indicated in this pipeline. So if you first go to numerical pipe, use a simple imputer on the numerical, after it has done that, to scale the data, come to the categorical variables, use imputer, simple imputer, and then use one out encoder, and then to combine both of them, and then to go to this final pipeline that is here, and then um, um, do all the process that we have seen above here, and after it has done all those things, it now gets the um, particular um, um, data, the transform data, and run it through this model, right? So basically, it just streamlines all the process. So we use the final pipe dot bit, and we say x train, y train. So before we run this, we are going to have to import some modules, some classes. Yes, yeah, so we have simple imputer here, yeah, so and one hot encoder. So I'm going to come and say from sklearn dot input import simple imputer from sklearn dot pre processing import um one hot encoder and standard scalar. So these are, let me see if I've imported all the necessary um, classes, right? So, okay, column transformer, right? So I'm going to come here um, and say from sklearn, I think, dot compose. This is a new uh, module here, dot compose, import column transformer. So now you've imported all these necessary classes. Can I just come and run this? Let's hope it runs because there is a lot of code here and it can be prone to error. So, um, column transformer. Okay, S is now here. Transformer. Uh, linear regression. Okay, we didn't import linear regression. So, we'll come and say linear. Regression. All right, so we'll do that. So we'll now come here, run it again, and hope there's no error. All right, so we don't have any error. So all this pipeline has been recorded in our um in 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 the memory. So when we just come here and see a final pipe dot fit, what it does that it trains the. Okay, let's see what error is here now. A given column is not a column of the data frame. Hmm. Okay, let's check. Okay. So we have extra. Let's print extra to see. Extra. Oh, okay. So we didn't split. We didn't split this particular. Um, new this thing that we did here. So we're just going to have to import, copy this that we have here, right? Copy this, 
bring it here basically um uh, let me create another this thing so i'll run this right i'll run this again right and then um remove this one and then run this again okay or, uh, why okay so now our why we didn't treat the um the missing value in our y so that that should not be an issue so you can easily just come here and say um y dot fill fill n a and we're just going to come and say y dot mean in place equals to true right. so i'll run this right come here again and run this um come here again and run this come here again and run this come here again and run this hoping that it doesn't give another error float agreement will be a string or ring number not method Okay, so let's let's just try to remove all this error. So I just as I'm working at this, error, just be pulling me to to so that you know how you approach us to when um, when you when you encounter them. All right. So this is actually a very common thing um, in ML process, right? So let's see what the problem is. You know, I don't think this is a problem. So. What was the error saying exactly? Um, it's not the best thing up there. Field argument must be a stronger in an argument. So just, just let's, if you can point out anything, I would really be very, very nice. So let's just check it out to be sure. So whenever you have a lot of code, like you have a lot of code happening, you are very, very prone to error. So it's it's actually um very very very, very normal. So let's see what is happening here. Let's see. The sound said something in the group chat. Um, I think we include number instead of np dot array. Okay, um, we'll try that. Let's see. Now this include number actually selects those the data types right that are non uh, that, that are not not numeric right. So exclude will remove data types that are in this particular place as numerically. Include will include those ones. Problem is from here. Okay, let's see this. Okay, okay. As you can see, I, this is the problem here. Mean. So this mean is supposed to be a method, right? So it's supposed to be a method here. So let's let's run rerun this again here. You see the mean here. It's supposed to be a method. So these are just tiny tiny mistakes that you can that you might make. Where's this one coming from again? Um. So tiny mistakes that you might make. I hope it doesn't. So basically, you see, we've we've trained our model, and this is the output we're getting. So this is the pipeline process, basically. So you see, the preprocessing the column transformer was used, right, on the numerical variable separately, and then on the categorical variable separately. So after it 
perform the pre-processing technique, then it combined both features, right? And trained the um, newly pre-processed features on using linear regression algorithms. So you can see how the process was streamlined. So instead of doing all those things, all these simple imputer and standard scalar separately, because it is actually a new approach to making your work very, very, very organized. So you just create pipelines for the features. So depending on what you want to do, you can basically just create the pipeline for it. If you have different um, variable types, you can use column transformer to combine them after creating pipelines for each of the features in your data set. If you have just one feature in your data set, you don't need to do, use column transformer. You just create one pipeline for it. And then you will now create the final pipeline. It's going to pre-process and um, run your model basically. Or you can even, or you can even add model. Yes, so if you can even come here for your for one feature and just say um, model, say model, and you say linear regression, linear regression. Okay, so you get the idea of pipeline. You can add anything you want to add. Right, so it will go step by step. Once you fill in the um, missing value, the next thing is to scale it. After it has scaled, the next thing is now to train it. Understand? So once you've created this pipeline, you can now come and say norm pipe dot fit, and you put s train, and you say y train. You understand? So this is just how pipeline. It, is, it makes work very very easy. You understand? So I'm very sure most of us are, are going to use it now. Project because why? Why not? <laughs> why going through the stress of doing all these processing techniques separately? Why when you can just use pipeline? I right, but make sure that you know how to do these processing techniques on their own first. Make sure pipeline is a is a kind of more efficient method, an advanced method. So you know you need to know how to do all these ones separately before you use your pipeline you understand so, so this is just another technique in SKLN that just make your work easier so this is um, going to be it for for that we're going to be going into what we have for today so you know how to, you know what to do now you can see in this case now we have skiller we now have pca right it's it, it we can even add pca to our components here basically and then um, basically transform our logistic regression or use logistic regression. So the same thing, you can come here and put PCA. You can see PCA and say PCA and say N component equals to, let's say, 10, right? So you cover it and then you run it and um, that's the problem. Okay, so call, put question mark here. And then you train it. So you see that now it has actually added PCA. Yeah, you can see here that we have PCA as another step, right? After it has transformed our numerical and categorical it will now get a new feature combined. It will now use PCA to reduce the number of features to 10, and it will now train our model on the feature, on the 10 feature data set. So I hope you understand the idea behind this pipeline. You can basically add anything here. You can be anything that you want to add. You can just add it. So it will do everything for you. It makes your life easy, basically. So that is it for pipeline. I hope we are all following and um, we understand this. So please let me know if everyone is still following me so we proceed to what we have next for today. All right, all right, uh, great. So today we are going to be looking at what we call regularization techniques. So um, um, in the um, in the previous um, 
um, topic we just treated, I talked about something about regularization. So we are going to look at it in more detail. Yeah. So um, we'll look at what regularization is, right? So I've explained it already. So regularization is a technique used in machine learning to prevent overfitting, right? So regularization is a technique used in machine learning to what prevent overfitting. So when you see overfitting, regularization is a, a way we can actually reduce it, right? So how does regularization do, do this? So it's actually do it by adding additional information to our model. So these are mathematical um, cons, um, 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 equations, right? So it adds some, 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 um, some extra stuff to the equation to penalize that model. Don't worry, as we're moving, we're going to explain it. So it adds something, some extra stuff to the model. As we saw in lasso regression, which is the embedded technique in feature selection, lasso regression um, works by removing features that are not really important when the model is trained, right? So it, it has a way of doing that, but let's just move on. So this additional information usually takes the form of a penalty. So we call it penalty. So we all know what a penalty is, right? A penalty is basically like um, a punishment for something. So let's just come here. So a punishment for something. So in machine learning, we can actually penalize our model. If our model is performing too well, that means it is overfitting, it is learning too much, we can penalize it. So it will reduce the amount of information it is learning. That's basically what penalty is, right? And that's what regularization does. It penalizes our model. If you don't remember, or if after this class you forget what regularization is, don't forget this, this thing I just said. Regularization does what? Penalizes our model. Understand? It penalizes our model. So the penalty is in form of a particular, an addition to the equation of that particular algorithm. So the was the importance of regularization in machine learning. So regularization helps ensure that the model performs well on new unseen data by discouraging same thing, another word, penalizing, by penalizing, by discouraging, everything is the same, right? So, so basically you get the idea behind regularization. So by discouraging overly complex models that might fit the training data too closely. So I've already explained this already, the problem of over, overfitting, and the bias variance trade off. So now let's go to the main thing. What are the types of regularization techniques we have? So we basically we have two types of regularization techniques, right? We have um, the L1 regularization, which I explained initially, I, I introduced it to us, which is called what? Lasso regression, right? Or lasso. We have the second one, which is called L2 regularization. L2 regularization, which is also called ridge regression. You understand? So ridge, ridge, it's called ridge basically, right? So we have L1 and we have L2. So these are the basic two types of regularization. So you'll be seeing this more often, even as you're advancing in machine learning, you are still going to be using the concept of L1 and L2 regularization in preventing overfitting. Right, so remember I told us the different ways of pre preventing overfitting by um, removing features, blah, 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 and everything. But this regularization is a very, very effective way of preventing overfitting. So it is most commonly used than other methods, right? So what, what, what happens in L1? So L1 basically adds the absolute values of the coefficient to the cost function. So it's a mathematical terminologies, right? So as I told you, it adds a particular um, value to the equation. So if you come here, you see this nice circle here now, right? This is what is being added when you use L1 regularization, right? This is what has been added. When you use L2 regularization, this is what has been added. So I, we are, this is not a, we are not, uh, um, this is a math class. We are not going to talk about the mathematics behind it, but this is basically what regularizes the model. So just keep that at the back of your mind. If you want to read further, feel free to do that. So in L1, now, basically what, what L1 does is that it drives some coefficients to zero, right? So um, basically, uh, it's, there's what we call coefficient. Coefficient is that value that is added to each feature, 
So if the coefficient of a particular feature is high, that means the impact it has on the model entirely is high. If the coefficient is, is low, the impact is what low, right? So what LO and regularization does is that it drives some coefficients to zero, basically. So it looks at some of the features coefficient after you train the model. It's after you train your model that you have coefficient. So it looks at the coefficients of the different features and drives them to zero using this equation that we've looked at here, right? It drives it to zero and then it um, now performs feature selection by removing the less important features. So after it has driven down the PM, some of the, because when you overfit your data, that means you are learning too much. So you usually have high, high coefficient for each feature. So using lasso regression will now start to penalize each coefficient. It will look at the features and the coefficient and start penalizing it, penalizing it by reducing it. It reduces the coefficient of some of those features. You understand, right? So it looks at it, reduce it, reduce it, reduce it, reduce it, reduce it, and then does perform feature selection by removing the less important features, that is the features with the lowest coefficients in that particular model. So this is the same, this is, it performs two things here. L1 regularization performs both um, regularization and what? Perform regularization and feature selection on your data. So it does two things at the same time. L1 performs regularization at the same time doing feature selection, right? So that is basically what it does. So um, how do you apply? So lasso regression is useful when you have a high dimensional data set with many features and you want to identify and retain only the most important ones. So as we've, we've talked about that already doing feature selection. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? For lasso, the advantage, you can reduce the number of features, making the model simpler and more interpretable. Right, it may not work with highly correlated features as it tends to select one and ignore others. So, this is actually um, um, its advantage of lasso. Right, so you already know the the downside of having correlated features. So, we talked about this when we we're talking about um, assumptions of linear regression. Right, so co having correlated feature is not really good for our model. So, you need to always drop models that are highly correlated. So this is the equation for L1 regularization, right? And um, we look at ridge, ridge regression. So ridge regression does the same thing. It regularizes our model when it is overfitting or it prevents overfitting. So what does L1 do, L2 do? L2 adds the squared values of the square. So this is the mathematical stuff it does, right? So you can just read that later, right? So the effect or how it does is that it does not eliminate feature like L1. L1 eliminates feature, right? But what L2 does is that it reduces their impact by shrinking the coefficients towards zero. So that is the difference. L1 reduces the impact, right, by shrinking coefficient. As it's reducing it, it also removes or select features like based on the coefficient. But L2, it just reduces it, but it doesn't, it doesn't select any feature. It doesn't remove any feature, basically. It just reduces their impact, right, um, overall. So that is really the difference between L1 and L2 um, regularization, lasso and ridge um, um, regularization. So an example is um, when you want to, when all features are actually useful, you don't want to remove any feature, but you want to minimize the impact of the feature so that you can prevent overfitting, right? So um, these are the advantages and disadvantages. Right, as you can see, the advantage is that it does not perform feature selection, so all features will remain in the model. So, just know that ridge regression is going to be more computationally um, intensive, right? Because it is still retaining all the features we have in our data set. So, uh, we're not going to go over this mathematical equation here. So, this is basically what it does um, when preventing or when regularizing our data. So we are going to uh, look at the code um, implementation of this shortly, but let me just go over the last one we have here. So we have what we call elastic net regularization. So this elastic net is a combination. So when you are confused, you don't really know which one to use. You don't, don't know if L1 will be the best or L2 regression, or L2 regularization will be the best. You can use elastic net. So elastic, elastic net actually, um, 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 combines these two um, regularization techniques and apply it to our model, right? 
So all these things are just to prevent overfitting. So in the case where your model is not overfitting, there is no need to apply regularization, right? So you don't need to apply any regularization. So the regularization is coming in only when your model is overfitting. I remember we discussed overfitting already. We talked about the, the, the downside of overfitting. We don't want our model to overfit at all. And we also don't want our model to work on that. So we want our model to actually um, have be in that middle ground, right? Between overfitting and underfitting, all right? So... Basically, elastic net it combines it. So we already know um, what L1 um, regularization do and what L2 regularization two does, right? So um, it balances the benefits of lasso regression, which is feature selection and also ridge regression. So I forgot to mention that ridge regression here and those correlated features well. So just know that this is this is the advantage of um, of um, ridge regression. So it and those correlated feature lasso doesn't perform well with correlated features. So correlated features are actually features that are highly, um, they, they have a, a very strong relationship. So if you plot a scatter plot of two features and they are moving in the same direction, they are, that is what we call a correlated feature. So we've done this already, already we understand what it means. So when you have this kind of features, you want to make sure that um, um, you, you use ridge regression instead of lasso regression. And the reason why we don't usually, um, we, we don't like correlated features is because we don't know which of those features is having impact on our outcome because they are the same thing, right? Basically, so they are, they are basically the same thing, right? So we don't know which one is having the impact it is having on our outcome. So now let's just look at that. We can implement that and we call it a day. So we'll look at the implementation. Very, very straightforward. So L1, L2, and um, what elastic net, right? So um, quickly look at that. So there's something we need to also know. These regularization techniques, right? They can be applied to several models, several algorithms rather. So linear regression, I said it initially that ridge regression and linear um, and last. I don't know why this network is just penetrating. I honestly don't understand. But I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Hello, hope everyone can hear. Can everyone hear me? Please, let's, okay, let's just move on. I want to be sure everyone can hear me. I just one person responding, yeah. Okay, all right. So yeah, so I told you that linear lasso regression is what? Linear regression plus what? Plus what? Um, lasso regression is linear regression plus what? I said it initially. Exactly, linear regression plus regularization, right? So when you want to add regularization to your linear regression, you use ridge regression or lasso regression directly, right? So basically you import it like this. Let's just quickly demonstrate that. So to use lasso or ridge, you just come here and say from sklearn, from sklearn, dot linear model imports reach 
I also import um lasso, right? So if you call me and just click on it, you see basically what it does, right? So you see that this model solve a regression model where the loss function is blah 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 and everything. So it's just telling you what it does here. Yeah. So same for lasso, right? Same for lasso, right? So you can see it is you can see it's a linear what model trained with L1 prior as regularization, aka lasso. So don't get confused. This last one and reached are linear regressions, but what they have regularizations added to them. So ridge here, you can see ridge is what? What did I press now? Ridge is um ridge is linear. This linear least square is linear regression with L2 regularization. You understand? So we can just the same way we would um 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 um, create our linear regression model is the same way we can create a um, ridge regression. So we can basically just come here and change it to a ridge. Let's just use our pipeline. So we use ridge here, right? We'll run that and we're going to come here and train our data. So you can see what's happening here. It uses ridge regression here. Have you seen it? So when you are using linear regression, you try to check if your model is overfitting, then you now try to use ridge regression, right? If it is lasso regression, if um, you try ridge, you can also try lasso. Lasso will remove some features for you, right? To do feature selection. So you can see if you train this model again, it's going to you can see that it's now using lasso, right? So this is basically how you use lasso and ridge in linear regression. So now when you want to use um um what do I call it? Um Okay, this is not the notebook here. So when you want to use L1 and L2 regression in logistic regression, the way you do it is that you add is in a, another parameter called L penalty. Penalty. So this penalty can either be L2. I think L2. I don't know if L1 is there, but basically you can put L2 or L1 as penalty for your logistic regression. So if we just come here, I know this is not. Um, okay, I'm going to. Uh, okay, let me just change this to logistic. I'm going to change the data to so logistic regression. So if we turn our logistic regression, we see that it's overfitting. We can also come and add penalty. So we can see penalty L1. L1 is what? Last two, right? And L2 is what? Is reach. So if I come here and check, you see that we have um, penalty here. So the penalty by default, you can see that by default, self logistic regression is adding a ridge regression by default as penalty. That is L2 regression. But well, I think you can actually change it to L1 if you want. So you can change it right see, to L1 or L2. You can use elastic net, as you can see. You can change it to elastic net, L1 or L2. So I can come here and say elastic net, elastic net. Which is going to combine L1 and L2. So if I come here and train my do this particular um data, where is that data? So I'm going to use this data right to train it on this. I'm going to train it here, do this, and then fit. Oh, okay, so Oh, server, blah, 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 all right. Okay, okay, so now you can see that we, there is another parameter that we need to change to enable this. So there's a parameter called solver, where is it, solver. This solver is actually the, the approach that the logistic regression will take. So we have a lot of parameters here. So these are things that you can do during hyperparameter tuning that we've talked about. So you can be looking at all these parameters and checking the combination, which one is going to give you the best um, um, results, right? So you can even come to that solver. If you scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Okay, scroll down. You can see it has different solvers. So we have LB, FGS, we have um, LibNinia, right? So we have a lot of them. So the default by the default here is LB, FGS. So as a data scientist, you should actually go and read about all these different solvers if you want to be very, very efficient. You can just you don't need to know them in there, but just know their differences, what they do, 
right? So if I say, let me change the server to libnina, I'll come here and say, um, I'll say server and say libnina, and let me try the elastic net again to see if it will work. All right, let me put a comma here and then come here and train it. So I think um, libnina, okay. Okay, only Saga. So let me change it. So it's even telling you exactly what to do. So you can change it to Saga. So you'll be able to use the Elastic Net um, regularization. So if I come here and I run it, why is this still giving me L1 ratio must be specified? Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, you need to specify the ratio because it's Elastic Net. So basically, these are just the things you'll be doing. Let me see the name of the parameter for that. One ratio, so you can see it here. One ratio, come and say equal to 0 0.5, right? So it will be equal, L1 and L2 will be equally applied. So basically, you see it has performed the whole thing here. Right? You see the parameters that we have here L1 ratio 0 0.5. So this 0 0.5 basically means the read regression and the um, lasso should be applied equally. That is 50% of L1, 50% of L2. If you make it 0 0.7, that means L1 will be 70%. That is lasso, which will be what? 30%. So elastic net combines both of them, but it combines them in proportion that you can specify. So these are just the ways you can use um, a, lot of, a lot of these parameters to ensure that you get the optimal performance. So that is for regularization basically we're actually done with it so you can still check out um how to um apply it in other algorithms but basically it's mostly um in lasso sorry linear regression and logistic regression so we also have um um support vector machine right so there's what we call c okay i forgot to mention in um lasso regression and read regression we have what we call alpha so alpha basically determines the um, the amount of regularization that will be applied or the penalty, the amount of penalty that will be applied. So if your alpha is very low, like let's say 0 0.1, right? Then the um, regularization that will be applied will be very, very low, right? It will just be like, just penalize it a little. But if, you, if your alpha is like one, it's going to penalize a lot. Like the penalty will be very high. So even in read regression and lasso, you still have a value of alpha, a parameter called alpha that you can specify. So as you can see now, there are a lot of things happening. Like your head now is full. Oh, what will I do? What will I try? So basically just to be experimenting with them, right? Just to be experimenting, check which one, the combination that will give you the best result and how you are going to be able to tune your parameter for this particular model to give you this particular um, result. So, I've been mean, knowing how to use grid search. All, all these things would be easy for you. So you don't have you don't have to do it manually. You just have to create a params grid. Use a dictionary to create the different parameters. Put the parameters you want to use in a grid. Then use your grid search CV or your randomized search CV to search through those hyper parameters, and you're going to get the result. So see, there are a lot of things I didn't even mention here, right? So just explore your own, but this is a very good foundation, a very good starting point for you as a data scientist, right? It's a very interesting field, I won't lie. Like you would love it. So there are a lot of things to do as a data scientist, right? So this is going to be it for today. So we basically covered um, everything. So the remaining things here are just um, further stuff that you can do using grid search CV for the IPAP, um, for the lasso and the, um, and the, what we just did today. So now there's something you need to know. You need to ensure that you don't over penalize your model, right? You don't penalize it too much that it becomes to not um, um, learn very well. So you ensure that you do not add too much regularization, which can lead to underfitting. So why regularizing? You don't want to go from overfitting to underfitting. So you want to be sure that you are at a stable ground. You are maintaining balance. You understand? So um, just just take that. Um, just know that. So ignoring model inter interpretability. So this is actually um, uh, something that I can note. So regularization, like elastic nets, can make your models harder to interpret. So when you are actually focused on interpreting your model, you know that you don't use elastic nets. You use L1 or L2. 
So now let's just conclude what we've done today. So we can see that regularization is crucial in preventing overfitting, improving model, model generalization, and ensuring robust performance on new data. Great, there was something I didn't, I just think what I just remembered for the pipeline. So when you create a pipeline, the one of the benefits of creating a pipeline, where is that my pipeline? One of the benefits of creating a pipeline is that when you use it to uh, preprocess your S string, why predicting? You can quickly just use that same pipeline, just come and say final pipe dot predict and put your X test. So what happens is that this S test is going to go through all this process of transformation before it is being predicted. So you don't need to transform or preprocess your S test. Not your X test now. Um, basically, um, let's say, or you have a new data that you've not preprocessed yet. So you can just put it into this pipeline and it will just automatically um, um, preprocess everything and then make predictions on this particular data. So this is a good thing um, with pipelines, right? It just packages all these uh, um, 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 steps into a pipe. So you can just use it anywhere you want to use it. So I just wanted to chip that in. So um, as I was saying, we we're talking about the sum we we're summarizing what we did today. So regularization is crucial in preventing overfitting, improving model generalization, and ensuring robust performance on new data. So we all know this already. So we can see that these are the techniques um, that we've learned L1, L2. L1 is what? L1, just a very quick um, 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 revision. L1 is what again, as we said, L1 is what, L2 is what? Hello? L1 is what lasso, L2 is what reach. So I just wanted us to, to say that out loud, right? So you should be able to understand that and pick up something from this class. So importance of regularization. So uh, this is just, I just keep repeating it. Regularization adds penalty to the cost function, basically to, to what that means um, the, the error or calculates the error of your model. Discouraging complex models. So all these are just grammar, saying the same thing over and over again, right? So this is it for 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 today, guys. So we've actually um covered almost everything. We covered basically everything you need to start or as a data scientist to be able to create machine learning to build machine learning models, right? We've come a long way, and I believe this should be our last class officially. So next week is just going to be rounding up. We're going to be doing a revision. We're going to be doing, um, or we're going to be having um, uh, um, um, a talk, class talk, right? The, what I said initially that I will list out topics from beginning of the program to the end of the program. And anybody that's interested in it will pick one of those topics. And either on Saturday or on Sunday, you come up and just use 10 minutes to explain it to us. Understand. So this is a good way to also learn and just uh, um, 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 practice what we've been doing, basically. So teaching is the best way to learn. I keep saying that. So if you see, if um, this comes up on the group chat, take hold of it, right? This is a very, very good opportunity. So we're going to be doing that next week. We've come to the close of the uh, uh, um, uh, the, the machine learning um, topics, right? So this is not everything in machine learning. Machine learning is a very broad field, but this is enough, sufficient for you to do something, right? This is very sufficient for you to be able to build models, efficient models in SKLN. I would urge you, please go back to all the videos we've done, to the assignment, to the, um, the notebooks and every single material and resources, revise, revise, keep building yourself. Even after this program, don't stop, don't relent. For you to be to distinguish yourself, you have to know more. You have to understand this thing in depth, and you have to be able to present projects and things. And the way to understand most of these things is to actually practice. You understand? 
to practice, 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 practice. Keep building projects. This project we are going to be doing is a very good starting point for you, right? You can actually use it in interviews. You can actually use it as a, as your portfolio, starting portfolio, as you keep adding to it. Understood? So, yeah, this is uh, this is it, guys. We've 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 come we've come to the end of machine learning in Python. I really want to um. I really want to appreciate everyone of us here that has been consistent from the beginning till now. Like this is we've stayed here for three months. Do you know what that is? Like you've actually consistently shown up for good months without relenting. So trust me, I, I just want to believe that you are not the same as you were initially. Like you can tell yourself that just check yourself before you enter this program and now is there any difference? So that, that is how to know if this program has benefited you or if you've actually learned something from this program. So make sure you, you, you complete your project before the end or the deadline. There is no extension. Trust me, I'm not extending these dates for nothing. Nothing is going to make me extend um the deadline, right? Because we are going to be accepting court to immediately after this court. So we are already even busy with them. So you we don't want any extra uh, uh um 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 we don't want any any lag in this particular court, you understand? So please make sure that you stick with the deadline and um you do what you can do. Just do your best in this project, right? You don't need to get the best accuracy, you don't need to get the best, just do I, what I even want to see is the, the process you took in, in approaching the, the entire task, the, the project the project itself. I want to see how you approach it. And that is going to carry a lot more mark than your final metric itself, right? Or your final metric, of course, is also going to carry a uh, mark, right? Because that is what is going to let me know that you've actually built a very good model. So that is it for, for, um, for today. Um, there's no assignment, obviously. We've stopped that already last week. So um um yeah, I'm going to take questions before we before we wrap up. So if you have any question, please can you indicate? So we take that and call it a day. If you have any question, please indicate, indicate. All right. Ademo, Adego, okay. You can ask a question. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Thanks a lot. You come from a long way to this uh, moment. You are trying a lot. May Almighty God bless you. So um, my question is just that uh, after done with our work, maybe on Jupiter Notes, how do we make it presentable for those that are not even technically uh, or know about Anaconda or stuff like that? Can you yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what I mean by presentable is the way you write your code and the way you answer the questions. You understand? So why writing your code no, no, and answer? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going. That I, I mean myself. Like if I finish the project, so how to make it maybe presentable or like you know that Anaconda is is a specific platform that uh, not everybody has access to it. Yeah. Yes. How can I make my project maybe to be more feasible to non-technical people like stakeholders or the people that may, may want to assess me? So. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. There is what we call GitHub, right? So that is that is a different thing entirely. Um. GitHub is a platform where you can share your code. And you can just upload your code there and um, share the link with anybody that would be interested. And they can just go there and check out what you've done, basically. So GitHub is basically where you, you just put your code so anybody can see it. So depending on, regardless of whether they have an Anaconda or not, they can just click the link and you take them to GitHub and they can just go through your code and see what you've done. So um, I'm going to, if we have time next week, we're going to look at that. But that is actually not part of... Um, of the the curriculum so just explore that on your own check it out um, and see what what you can learn from there but if we have 
time next week, we can just look at that. But I'll try as I also try to no no I, I sending you a video will just complicate issue, but let's see by God's grace if we have enough time next week. Okay, right, sir. So that just, that second is that. Second is that. At what exactly stage is good to apply the dimensionality reduction or official selection? Like now, when I apply it, because I see from your example, you always apply it to S variable only. Yes, when I apply yeah. it to both, yes. yes. Can but you apply you it to both words? Uh, the both my uh, my split data or the clean data a whole apart from the target okay. one. Okay, yeah, you always apply it to your preprocessed data. Is when you've already preprocessed your data finished that you now reduce the dimension. You understand? So it's when you've applied all this preprocessing technique that you can now apply PCA. Or oh. any dimensionality reduction technique you are using, so you don't do oh. it at the initial period because your data is is not is dirty. It might have some categorical data, and PCA doesn't take in categorical data. You understand? So it's when you've converted everything to numbers, you've preprocessed everything that you can now use PCA to reduce the features. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. All right, you're welcome. Hi, right, um, about Nego, you can go on to speak. You're on mute. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening, sir. First and foremost, uh, I say thank you, thank Carrier X, thank all the bodies that are involved in training us. We have benefited, like personally, me, I've benefited a lot. I was a novice, just a beginner, but I have learned a lot. And I appreciate your team. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my, you. my question, like, I want you to throw more light on domain knowledge, on selecting features and uh, uh, look, uh, coloration, uh, coloration, uh, coloration uh, values and uh, no variance. I want you to throw more light on these processes, these methods in selecting the uh, uh, features. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so now these are actually very important concepts, like very, very important concepts that you need to understand like as a data scientist. Um, um, you, you, you said variance, you said correlated features and um, yes. domain knowledge, domain right? knowledge. Yes. Yeah, so domain knowledge, um, I would, first of all, I would advise you to, um, I don't know if you've gone through the video already, but if you've gone through the video and it's still not, um, you still didn't get it, right? So I'm just going to just say a few things about that. So domain knowledge is a part of data science. Now, we have data scientists work in industries just know that data scientists work in industries they work in businesses and their aim in any way they are found is to make sense of a data right a company would probably have an issue or a task or a problem they're trying to solve and they have data and they have data scientists so when they give you your data the data you need to understand the context, the situation, the business, the domain. That is where domain comes in, the domain. So that, because if you don't understand the domain, you will not be able to understand how to even start at the first place on, or how to approach it. Let's assume you are working in a healthcare industry as a data scientist. Obviously, you need to have domain knowledge about healthcare. You need to know this um, common concept in healthcare. You need to know those things. Because when you're given a data, the data will evolve around the healthcare domain. So you have to understand to an extent the domain that you're working in. If you're working in the financial sector as a data scientist, you need to understand the domain knowledge or the concept in finance. You need to understand all these things, basic, basic knowledge that you need to know in the financial industry. That's what domain knowledge is. Because if you don't, it will be difficult for you to make good sense or get results that really make sense because you don't even understand what you are doing at the first place. If you're working in um, 
the the hospitality industry, hotel and the rest. You need to understand how it works, right? You need to understand that domain. So data scientists don't work in isolation, though they work in industries and they work to solve business problems using machine learning and other techniques. So you have to understand the domain that you are in and understand how to make sense of your data with respect to that domain. Do you understand? Yes, sir. All right. So now for variance, I said that variance is, is almost synonymous to information. The higher the variance of in a particular variable, the higher information that variable is carrying. So when you are doing feature selection, the variables with the lower variance has lower information. So you want to select those ones with lower inform. You want to select those ones with higher information. So you discard the variables with lower information and you keep those with higher information or higher information, right? Well, that is just basically what variance is. Variance is synonymous, almost synonymous to make you understand with information, basically. So the same concept that is used in PCA, the same concept that is used in some invariance threshold and some other feature selection process. Why the last one? Um, well, sorry, what was the last um, 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 question again? The last one is uh, low correlation uh, values. The low correlation, okay, you mean correlated features. So correlated yes, features, as I said, are features that are highly correlated with each other. So if something is highly correlated with themselves, that means they have a strong relationship. That means they are similar in the way they are. Right? So if you have a PMA, two features in your data set that are highly correlated, that means two of them are similar. They, so if the first feature is having an impact on the outcome, the second feature, feature will be having similar impact. So it is basically like redundant, like the... The first feature basically has already, um, uh, um, it has added a particular um, um, impact. It has an impact on the outcome, making that second variable redundant because they are the same thing. You understand? They are the same, they, they have the same, um, uh, they are just the same basically. You understand? So if they're highly correlated, you need to look for a way to kind of drop the second feature that is correlated with it. But basically, you, you don't, look into all this you just work with your data but if you really want to go in depth into all the features especially numerical features you have to now start looking at correlations with behind these features that's why we do um correlation matrix right we look at we use sns.heatmap to check correlation between variables so we're not just doing it because we want to do it we are doing it because we want to check how each feature is correlated with each other you understand so from there you can now start looking at the ones that you can Pick the ones that you can drop and the ones that, um, 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 yeah, basically it will just inform your choice on how to select your features, right? So the thing is that um, um, we, 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 we don't have enough time to dis dissect each of these concepts. So each of these concepts that we've looked at, they actually can have their own dedicated um, class or even, um, and you can use like one week to teach it you will never exhaust it, but this is just the basic idea and you need the, the basic idea is actually sufficient for you to move on. But if you want to go in depth into understanding it, then fine, great. You can just get resources out there and just dissect and understand how it is, um, um, what exactly it is. So that, that's just it for, for that. So correlated um, features, variance and domain knowledge, they're actually important concepts. And I believe um, I've been able to just giving you an idea on what they do and, and how they are, yeah. right? So are you- Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, thank you, yes, right. yes, so thank you sir. Another question? Any other question? Any other question? All right, Dairo, you can go and ask Aruna. I hope I'm pronouncing your name. All right. Yeah, I'm mute now, you can ask a question. Uh, good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, so my question is regarding uh, model evaluation under the project. Yeah. You you wrote ROC dash AUC. Yeah. Um, I know that there is ROC underscore AUC score, which we've not uh, used it in this uh, our classes, but I know it. Uh, of its existence. 
the one we did with you is ROC Cov and the AUC. So I don't. I want to know: is it that ROC AUC score you want, or it is the ROC Cov and the AUC? Um, the the thing is that in SKLN there are usually two things that usually mean the same thing. Most of the time, you have two different things that can do the same thing, right? So R R O C A U C score is um if i'm correct is the same with roc auc basically so if you, you can check it while writing your code just use the two functions to get the score and see if the score is similar right so this is just um redundancy in sklearn so don't just get don't get confused like so you get to a point where you'll be seeing how you, different different things because some versions like for instance now sklearn version one would be using ROC AUC score. So when they improve the version, they'll not change it to ROC AUC alone without the score, but they have not created the former function. So sometimes those overlap and confuse some persons. You can, you can just check, check it out, use the same function, you see that it's giving you the same thing. So, but what you just say is that you have two things you have the ROC core and you have the AUC score. That is just it. Like, so anything that is outside this is like, I don't think there's any other thing outside this. So if you're having two different functions, just check it to be sure that they, uh, it, it's actually um, giving the same thing because that is what most, that is most likely what it is going to be giving you the same particular score. All right. Yes. So, so, those, continue, continue. I know it continues that you are saying something. Like I'm saying, but just try to follow um, the particular um, um, functions that was used in the class, you understand? Okay, in case okay. okay sir. Yeah. That, so my, my second question is, for the project, can I just use, uh, if I use this pipeline that you taught us today, will it be sufficient as in, okay? <laughs> um, if, you can, you, yeah, definitely. It's 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 a it's a way to build models. So yeah, if you use it, fine. If you want to use it too, fine. Just depends on how you want to approach it. But yeah, it's it's allowed actually. You can use the pipeline. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. So, any other question before we call it a day? All right, so um, we're going to be um, stopping at this point. I really enjoyed my time with everyone. So ensure you enjoy the rest of your day and um, have a lovely weekend. So you have a lot of work ahead of you. You have a lot of things to do this week and next week. You have a lot of materials to review. You can actually even just collaborate, right? You can meet other persons if you are facing difficulty. Just meet other of your colleagues to help you. So this is just going to make everything faster and help you learn faster. Too. So um, good night from here and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for joining the class. And ensure that you drop all your lands today, like our tradition, just drop all your lands today. The point, the important point you, you picked from this class is to help you to actually reflect on the class again as you are typing, you understand? So immediately we drop this call, try to go through what we um, try to um, write out the points you've learned from this class. It will help you reflect and it also help you bring back to memory. So it's a very good way to, to keep to memory what you've learned in today's class. So the recording for today, I will try as much as I can to drop it today. If not, I will drop it tomorrow morning. All right. So yeah, thank you very much. Bye.